and we are live. One, two. Hello, and you are listening to Mage, the podcast. This is the show where we talk about all things, well, Mage, the Ascension. And on today's show, the topic is Mage Chronicles. It's a new segment where we talk to game players and storytellers, and we talk about a particular chronicle that was very special to them. I want to talk about why it was so special. And this one is actually very special for the simple fact that we're going to be talking about the Sorcerer's Crusade. And our guest today, our Victor Joseph Kinzer, who is the co-host of the excellent Walking Away from McCarty podcast. And of course, Saturus Ricardo, the co-creator of Mage. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Ah, thanks. Hey, everybody. Thank you. So I'm very excited to have you guys on the show. But before we start, uh, some brief notes about uh, Mage in my life. Uh, I just got in the mail the other day, the Initiates of the Arts Flat Book. And I'm very excited to delve into that because it's going to be very relevant to the Chronicle that I'm going to be playing in a couple months. But hey, you know, as long as I've got you on the line, Saturus, why do they call yes. it a Splat Book? Uh, I believe, and again, we're, we're getting like 25 years back here, uh, I believe that it came from what we called the, uh, the dot after, um, after, you know, between Mark and, with, uh, Ryan and Hagen, uh, I believe we called it a splat and, um, uh, I don't know where the, uh, where the, where the two got combined because that happened before I got, uh, before I got on staff, but, uh, I've noticed that the term it may not have originated with White Wolf because I've noticed in um, uh, in Shannon Applecline's series uh, Designers and Dragons the term is used universally for uh, for those sorts of books no matter who published them so I'm not sure <laughs> it's lost to the mist of time yeah I've talked to many people like oh you got to get this flat book you got to get that splat book I'm like why do they call it a splat and he's like I, I don't know it's just something you do you call it a splat book so there you go. Uh, the other thing that's going on in my life is that I'm running a chronicle on Twitter. It's kind of a play-by-post thing, and uh, I've never done it before, so I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. But if you want to follow it on Twitter, it's hashtag MTRPG. That would be Mage Twitter Role Playing Game. And so far, the characters we have is a virtual adept who is a refugee from Syria living in Canada. Uh, we have an orphan artist who is from London. We have a former Marine vet from uh, Pennsylvania who is a member of the Celestial Choir tradition. And a mysterious Akashic character who is kind of a time cop. And I'm really excited to get his character into the game. And uh, Victor, do you go by Victor or Victor Joseph? I go by Victor. Victor, uh, you expressed interest in playing the game. Do you have a character in mind yet? I do have a character in mind. Um, we just talked about this like two days ago. So I'm hoping to actually write him up tomorrow. But I want to play a syndicate member um oh, yes. i don't i don't quite know where i want to set them but i have some uh particular ideas about syndicate angles that are written they're pretty common in the books but i don't see a lot of players talk about those aspects of the syndicate so that's what i'm hoping to put together i'm really curious to see how they play because i've never gotten to play in a mage game where i was able to play a syndicate member so <laughs> Well, all of this is very new to me, and I'm very excited. And one of the challenges is writing on Twitter, and I've been using the Hemingway editor, which you can use online. And it says that if you, it wants you to use zero or less adjectives in your writing, which I thought was very cute. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's absurd. <laughs> adjectives have a purpose. They do get overused in fantasy writing, but, but adjectives have a purpose. Well, yeah. I, I, I do notice that it keeps my, light, my writing streamlined, and somewhat, sometimes I can't get around it. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I would like to talk briefly about walking away from Arcadia because before we started the show, I was just telling Victor how much I love it. Uh, it seems to me that all the role-playing games, people are very passionate about it. The role-playing games that are set in World of Darkness, people seem to have more zest, more passion for it. And they all have different flavors, like the uh, Twin Cities by Night, their actual play is just mind-blowing, it's disturbing. There's an exalted podcast called The Deliberates, which is just very joyous and walking away from Arcadia just has so much depth to it. There's, there's uh, excerpts from short stories, there's music featured into it, and uh, there is actually one uh, audio book in the podcast so far. And to me, it's almost academic. It, it, it's that deep. So uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast, Victor. Um, yeah, Walking Away from Arcadia focuses entirely on Changeling the Dreaming, and it really grew out of conversations that my co-host and I used to have 
where we would just kind of go on for hours or longer talking about what Changeling the Dreaming could be. Um, you know, not, not to go too far into another game line, but Changeling the Dreaming probably went through a little more reinvention than the other games in the World of Darkness line. It was released with one idea that only kind of worked. They kind of changed themes at one point, then the developers changed and it changed themes again uh, in, in a way that I haven't, the other game lines have definitely gone through some reinvention, but not quite as drastic. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Simon and I did is there are a lot of kind of interesting empty spaces in Changeling the Dreaming that weren't explicitly written and we would fill them up in a certain way and think about like the implications of what was written as opposed to the design of what was written. And, you know, it just reached a point where I was like, you know, we're putting a lot of time and effort into this. What if we just recorded it? And Simon is a perfectionist and I'm a perfectionist and I co-hosted a queer radio show for three years and did segment production and we started going out and discovering there was a lot of music that was public domain, like recently produced, but released into public domain for common use. Um, and we were like, oh, well, if we can use this stuff, let's do full audio. And yeah, it just kind of snowballed. It is easily two to three times the podcast we originally planned on producing. <laughs> I definitely so I, want to talk to you about some of your uh, your method there because I'm wanting I'm, I'm wanting to do some podcasting soon myself. But sorry, go go ahead, Joe. Yeah, well, definitely. One the, so one of the things I've noticed in the uh, Twin Cities podcast, they're currently running a Changeling campaign, and one of the players he's actually never played the game, but he has found that out of all the World of Darkness games, it is actually the one that is the most horrific, the most terrifying. And I wanted to hear your <laughs> thoughts on that. Oh, that. Um, <laughs> so the funny thing about Changeling the Dreaming is it gets, it commonly gets one of two reactions. Either it's the darkest thing in the game line, or it's light and fluffy and has no place in the world of darkness. Um, and I've had quite a few conversations, mostly online, where someone will start in the light fluffy place and I'll, you know, engage with them along with a few other people. And by the end, they're like, no, I couldn't play this. This is too dark. Like, I can handle everything else. I can't handle that. Um, and I think I like to compare it to Wraith. Um, Wraith is this game that you pick it up and you immediately can tell it is just unendingly bleak. Like, the bleakness is layered. It's layers of awful upon awful upon awful. But even specters have a psyche. And there is a path for you to find a specter. And if you go through the long, hard work, it is made very clear that it is viable to both redeem them into a wraith and to maybe possibly get them to transcendence. And so you start from this ultimately horrific, bleak place. But like there's a ladder that is almost impossible to climb, but not quite impossible. And that makes it weird. Like that's, it. that's an exciting place to be. Changeling the Dreaming is exactly the opposite. We're preserving childhood and everything's bright and everything's shiny and there's no way out. Like, you're going to have to watch it all die. And that's what this game is about. It's about starting in this fantastic bubblegum place and watching it all die. And most people see all the bubblegum up front and they don't take the like three steps into the game, which unfortunately the first two editions, you really had to get past the core book to get to most of that. It was in the source books. That is not true in C20. It's very much all in that core book. Um, and so I think that's what that is. Like, it's just such a, it's such a high contrast game that it hits people unexpectedly. Well, I funny, really hope they play it. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil, go ahead. Oh, uh, funny thing about why, why those things are the way they are. So when uh, Wraith was being worked on, also a, a brief, here for uh, for vampire werewolf and mage the line developers were hired after the first edition book was finished uh, because that involved a whole lot of retconning and cleaning up on andrew's bills and my part we petitioned management to say why don't we get the line developer in from the beginning with wraith instead of at the uh, instead of afterward that way it's going to be a more integrated process uh, unfortunately that wound up 
we did do it, and Jen Jen Hartshorn was hired earlier on than uh, than than Andrew Bill or I were in the state in the process. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it wound up with a tremendous amount of creative uh, antagonism between different camps involved in the process, and the result was something that at the, at the beginning pleased nobody involved, and it was so emotionally excruciating to work on that game that everybody. Mark had really wanted it to be dark. I mean, it was you think you think you think Wraith is dark now. It was even darker in the original concept, and uh, what happened with that? Part of what happened with that was just Mark was convinced at that time that people this this is in ninety four, so the whole extreme thing was starting to really come in with the Rob Liefeld and all that stuff, and so it was all about darkness and angst and the darker we make it the more people will love it and that, that didn't end up actually being the case by the time wraith was done everybody including mark was like oh fuck it i need a break um and so changeling was deliberately counter programming that it was to go from the darkest to the lightest uh and once again ian was hired uh, ian lemke was hired before um, well he was on staff by that point anyway but he was brought in, brought in as changeling developer early on but having seen what uh having seen what jennifer went through he he really didn't want conflict so there it ended up kind of being a mutability process rather than a con rather than an <laughs> open office warfare um and there was also the whole thing with the cards, but that's a big digression. Um, uh. But anyway, <laughs> by the point where by the point where Changeling was finished, White Wolf had gone from being this the, the scrappy little outlaw company <clears throat> to being a majorly successful company that was undergoing its own a loss of childhood and loss of innocence for a variety of reasons. And I think that element really played out subconsciously early on and then more consciously later. We were also all getting older. I mean, we were all in our 20s, teens in a few cases when we started. And by that point, you know, Mark was over 30, Rich was over 30, I was about 30. And that whole sense of mortality creeping in on you, both personally and professionally, was starting to, to come in. So I, I think that has a lot to do with that element of the game. Now, just to touch briefly upon the podcast, I really enjoyed yesterday's show because you featured an interview with Luca Carroll and Charlie Cantrell about the freeholds in the world of Changeling, mm -hmm. which they were actually singing praises to Satoros a lot because of uh, the way that Satoros handles uh, chantries. Uh, very briefly, what are some of the other topics you covered on Walking Away from Arcadia? Oh, uh, well, the first several episodes are really kind of meant as an intro to the game for people who've never picked up a book. So the first episode is just, what is this ridiculous changeling thing? And why do half people think it's super dark and half the people think it's ridiculously fluffy? And then we have an episode on, you know, banality and glamour. What is chimerical reality? How do you deal with it? We go through the kiss. So like the first, I'd say 10 episodes have like a C20 review and some really basic, like what is, what is the topography of this game? I would kind of call that sort of the unofficial sort of season one, although we're talking about transitioning format into what Simon and I are calling season two now. Um, but once we sort of got through that, we started getting into, um, uh, I'd say more fringe topics. Uh, we did a really great episode on uh, the Nunyahi where we interviewed James High, and I have to thank Satiros. He he put that connection together for me, which was amazing. Um, and those are indigenous American fairies in the game. Um, we've had conversations about queer community themes and how they relate to Changeling. Um, we have an episode upcoming on disability and how it relates to the chimerical reality and the being seen and unseen and banality triggers and glamour and a couple of the groups in changeling that are explicitly expressed as having disabilities and how that can be explored um and played with i mean like you said we had uh, i think you called it uh, an audio novel we did a series uh, an episode on history uh like the canon history and we did it as a series of vignettes that we wrote and then produced as audio production um, and then we did a follow-up where we talked about why we made those choices. So, I mean, the topics have kind of run the gambit. Um, yeah. Well, if anyone listening to this show wants a really fantastic podcast to listen to, I highly recommend Walk Away from Arcadia. All right. So 
uh, we're very close to getting to the meat of the topic, even though we've been talking for almost 15 minutes. The question I ask all new guests to the show is, what got them into role-playing games, and how did that lead to Mage? And also, in this particular case, how did that lead to Changeling? Um, so, I mentioned this a little bit before we started recording. My first full role-playing book was Vampire Dark Ages. Um, I was originally introduced to Vampire, I was like in junior high, and there were some like just post-college, there was a just post-college couple that lived next to me, and they got me into Magic the Gathering, and I was a huge geek. And then they had this game called Jihad. It was still called Jihad at that point. Um, and I was like, what's this? And we played a couple rounds and I was immediately hooked. Um, but, you know, I I had like a five ten dollars allowance still at that point. I, there's no way I could buy one of the core books from the role-playing game. Um, that card game became Vampire the Eternal Struggle, which is based on Vampire the Masquerade. Um, I reached the point where I was a freshman in high school and I could like scrape together the $35 to like pay for, you know, cover price plus tax on a core book and i was like so obsessively looking at oh my god what am i gonna buy because this <laughs> is all i'm gonna have for a while um and at that point the only game i really knew was vampire and my friends knew vampire and so i was gonna pick up what i could play with my friends um and i ended up buying the original vampire of the dark ages not so much because i wanted to play the dark ages setting i was more interested in the modern setting but i picked it up and at that point um it was still vampire second edition so for 30 bucks, you got seven clans, a handful of disciplines, and that was kind of it. Or for 30 bucks, you got Dark Ages, you got 13 clans up to sixth level, so one higher level than the second edition core book of all of the major disciplines, and the Bali and True Faith and all this stuff that you needed the player's guide or the storyteller's guide in the modern setting for. And I'm like, I mean, I live in the modern world. I can improv that part. I want all these rules. And so I bought that and I clung to it and I ran it to death. Um, and just slowly I'd pick up like the bargain bin books after that. I ended up with a bunch of Wraith because my local gaming store, um, they would do this thing once a year where they pulled all the stuff that hadn't sold and they put it on a table and it was 10% off for a week, then 20, then 30, then like eventually 90% off and usually around 70 to 80% off, there'd still be Wraith books sitting there. And I'm like, I will pay $3 for that. I can use that for something. <laughs> um, so yeah, my early role-playing days were really just kind of defined by, oh God, what can I afford? And my first mage book was GURPS Mage because GURPS Mage ended up on that table. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, I know how the D10 system works. This has the sphere write-ups and the tradition write-ups. I can, I can, I can make that work, right? No, I could not make that work. The first time I played Mage was in a cross-genre GURPS game, and I played a virtual adept, and I destroyed the poor GM. They were not prepared for spheres. <laughs> um, um, I always like the first time I picked up Mage. I'm like, I want to play this game because, and I didn't realize how odd this was until much later from the beginning i didn't like structure in my role-playing games i i i'd like spoke ill of D, D through all of high school which was mostly just teenage arrogance i play it now i love it now but at the time i was like oh levels like you're gonna tell me what i what i'm getting that's awful i i need no limitations like even with <laughs> vampire i played the ravnos because i could do whatever i wanted with chimistry um <laughs> you know so Mage was so, like, it was almost intoxicating whenever it was like a mixed group thing, which we did a lot in high school and college. Terribly unstable, but it's what everybody wanted to run. I always played a Mage, and it always threw the game off kilter. <laughs> um, I ran my first full-on Mage game, uh, like, a couple years after college. It was a three-year extravaganza. I look back on it now and go, wow, I really didn't get the game at all, but I had a lot of fun. Um... Yeah, and in terms of Changeling, I sort of came to it the same way. Like, I got into the World of Darkness, and then Changeling was part of the package, and I always liked using all the games together. Um, I didn't really totally get Changeling until I met Simon, my co-host on the podcast. And he ran a one-shot for me, and we started having these conversations, and suddenly, like, I saw all the real-world parallels in Changeling, um, something I've heard... Um, Satoros talk about before is that the world of darkness was meant to be kind of a satire and a commentary on the real world. <laughs> Surface reading of Changeling, you don't always get that, um, especially the old core books. 
But once I really started digging into it, it it became very clear how much of that was really there. Some of it was intentional. Some of it kind of feels accidental, but it works. And it's an amazing and consistent mishmash that you can kind of reconfigure into whatever you want. So it, it tapped that same, I can do what I want with it in a slightly different way than Mage did, which is, I think, why those are really my two favorite games. Thank you. All right. You, do you want, to, you want to hear a, uh, a behind the scenes on some of that, that satirizing real life element in Changeling? Please. I would love to. <laughs> so back when, uh, back when I was a teenager, I started, uh, you know, started dating that my person who would eventually become my first wife. And this was 80, 85. Uh, and her family was having some problems. They ended up putting her into this, this rehab cult called Straight Incorporated, even though she wasn't doing drugs. Um, the cult did a real, just did horrible things to her and the people in, and the people in there with her. And I went to go try and talk to her on her 18th birthday, got my ass kicked. Um, and she saw that and signed herself out and moved in with me. And the two of us tried to reconstruct who, the person she had been before they got in there, before they, they got in and mind fucked her. Um, and she still got the scars from it. Uh, you know, it's 30 something years later. But uh, when we were creating the antagonists, uh, an element of the Dante that I brought to the table was those cults, you know, the, 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 the will fix your child tough love cults and what those pe what those things would do with somebody who was, uh, you know, who, who was a changeling. Yeah, I've for anyone who hasn't read it there's a very long post going over that in much more detail on satyr's blog and i've read that and it's uh, that's a rough read and the dante are one of my favorite parts of the game um for a lot of reasons i'm i'm gay and the dante speak to a lot of experience that i had growing up um the first guy i was ever involved with was sent to a straight camp and so, like, my experience with the Dante is always through how we as a friend group coped with that. Um, yeah, so, like, that's that part of the game has always spoken to me very substantially. Um, and, yeah, I've, I've always appreciated that the game leans so heavily into those sorts of dynamics, even though they're sometimes really hard to make work at a game table. <laughs> I well, can Nikki only and, imagine. Uh, Nick, Nikki and Jackie, who were two of the the um, uh, two of the major creators on Ma uh, on rather well, they were involved in Mage as well, but on Changeling, and who were the line developers for a time, as I recall, um, they've been a couple since the late '60s, early '70s, I think. So, you know, there 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 were other people involved as well that I don't want to out anybody, but Nikki and Jackie have been out since the 90s so um, that's that's not saying any that that's not telling telling any tales out of school um so to speak but that was definitely uh, uh queer experience was definitely part of what was brought to the table on that game all right so let's get to mage chronicles and one of the reasons why i want to do this segment is one i'm still uh, a newbie in regards to mage and i figured this would be a good way to learn from others experiences uh, but also, people have such fantastic games that I thought this should be a great opportunity for people to tell why the chronicle that they were involved in, whether as a player or a storyteller, why that particular chronicle was so special. And so we're going to be talking about uh, Victor's experiences with the Sorceress Crusade. But before we begin, uh, there's a lot to this. So I think we have to talk very briefly about what is the Sorceress Crusade, which is why we have you here today, Soteros. What is the Sorceress Crusade? The Sorcerer's Crusade is Renaissance Mage, essentially. Um, I, I looked at it as the, the Renaissance, the, starting from the 1400s onward, being a, a major turning point for human history. Mage has always been about dynamism and about things going, about things going forward and transforming. And I looked at that and I said, that, that's a major flashpoint for the modern world. I mean, essentially, especially when you look at... Um, the, uh, the the Reconquista in uh, in Alandalus, the beginnings of, of modern Spain and Portugal. That's that's ground zero for the modern world. Uh, also, we had a few years earlier when we did the Fragile Path, 
which was uh, <laughs> Mage's Book of Nod. It was basically just put on the, on the schedule as Mage's Book of Nod. And at the point where we worked on Fragile Path, uh, uh, my team and I started were laying the groundwork for Mage's back history. And we, we told this Rashomon style tale uh, of the foundation of the traditions. And when we started figuring out what the what the, the historical mage game was going to be, people had initially wanted it to be medieval mage. And I'm like, you already got that. It's called Ars Magica. Um, I want to do something different. Uh, and I really, really wanted to explore the world that we had created with that foundation of the traditions and the fragile path. And so I said, let's do it Renaissance, you know, um, like 1400 to 1600 period. And uh, that just, I wound up having a field day with it. Uh, I would still, I would gladly, uh, glad, gladly do the line again and, uh, and, and, and do more of it, a lot more of it, uh, if, it if it were my call, <laughs> which unfortunately <laughs> it's not. It's, it's easily one of my favorite time period pieces and the whole line. I mean, I've, I've, played and looked at a lot of other world of darkness time period pieces but sorcerer's crusade is so rich and it it's funny because it feels like it's ev it's everyone's bucket list game that no one has played um when we when we started the chronicle um we had just had a very brief mage chronicle that kind of fell apart because the st went very like apocalyptic nihilist with it and he thought he'd warned us adequately about that and he hadn't and the players weren't really prepped and we were like uh maybe maybe not um and so you know i said okay i'll run something you know what do people want to play and now we all kind of still had the mage bug and like two or three people were like oh man i wish sorcerer's crusade but and it's funny they all said that like they initiated with that and i'm like this is clearly on everyone's bucket list i'm just gonna run it let's just do this um and i i don't know why there's that feeling about it i've run into that online as well of like i wish i could play this but and part of the problem is, <laughs> is 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 it's the renaissance for all that for all that there were you know renaissance fairs and so forth the the actual historical renaissance is not something a lot of americans are familiar with uh, <laughs> years ago uh rochelle udall who's one of the major uh mage collaborators has been since the 90s uh she used to be in the um the atlanta renaissance festival and i was a cast member for a few years and she was telling me about the year that she quit uh, because the, uh, the the quote unquote creative director at that point, the previous year the the theme of uh, the, the the theme of the the cast um, there'd been like a meta plot, and uh, the theme of the meta plot was uh, King Arthur, and before that it was Robin Hood, and the creative director said this year the the cre you know, the, the the theme is going to be King Arthur versus Robin Hood. Anybody who knows what? anything about history knows how wrong that is. <laughs> But the the point is that nobody <laughs> except Rochelle objected, and Rochelle's like that's they're first of all historically they're like four hundred years apart, and they're almost a thousand years in the case of King Arthur divorced from the Renaissance. Why don't we do something with the Renaissance? We're a Renaissance fair, and the the casting director just sneered and said, "Oh, the real Renaissance was boring." <laughs> what? Right, exactly. But that's the kind of American perception. <laughs> so, I think a lot of I think a lot of it has just been high fantasy, the medieval style high fantasy. Even though there's an awful lot of Renaissance elements in it, the medieval high fantasy has is a familiar sell in um, in, in American culture, and it's not nearly as uh, it, it's it's not nearly as, as it doesn't have quite the wow factor that historical renaissance does also with uh, sorcerer's crusade i really wanted to start dealing outside of just europe um and so there's there's an awful lot of it covers an awful lot of ground we could have easily done three times the number of books that we did for the line and we had a number of them on a uh, on a projected schedule, which obviously didn't en end up happening. But I think if we'd had more material there about the Middle East, India, um, China and Japan, uh, the Americas, and so forth during that period, I think it probably would have taken off 
stronger and, and, and faster than it did. But it was, it was definitely a passion project for me, but it was not an, it's, it's not as easy to wrap your head around as just generic medieval fantasy. Well, and it's funny you mentioned those other areas. We never got to America. I left the players a hook or two to grab if they wanted. That's not the direction they went. But most of the campaign was not in Europe. We started in Venice. That went sideways real quick. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Oh, oh. Uh, it, the Venetian part of that isn't what went sideways. My players were just... Players will destroy anything they touch. Um... <laughs> um uh, I may never let a player take the Fey Affinity Merit and Mage ever again. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> going to throw that out there. Um, but we moved into India. We spent some time in India. <laughs> the player who had the Fey Affinity Merit is in the room next to me and giving me a very <laughs> vicious smirk. Um, <laughs> but we moved into India and we spent a bunch of time there. I ended up uh, centering a lot of the technocratic story in India because of uh, some research I ended up doing when I wanted a Celestial Master. The game was set in 1501 and I went... Cool, Celestial Masters. Where's Tycho Brahe right now? He's uh, five. Wait, he's five? This is within the realm of... The... So what are the Celestial Masters doing in Europe? Oh, nothing. And then I went looking for, like, who was working on astronomy at the time, and it was all in India. India. And it was India and Tycho Brahe... Uh -huh. Sorry, okay. I was just going to say, what was being developed in India is what Tycho Brahe would discover, like, 15 mm -hmm. years later. And I was like, oh, well, this just changed my campaign. <laughs> um, okay. They discovered a okay. hell of a lot of stuff in, uh, in, in, in Mesoamerica as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just All right. The things they didn't wind up burning. <laughs> Here's what I think we need to do. Uh, first of all, we have 17 listeners right now. So at any point, hey. anyone listening would like to uh, submit a question or a comment, just type it and we will get to it. Uh, but here's what I think we really need to do, gentlemen, is we have to talk about well, I think we need a synopsis of what your chronicle was, Victor, and then talk about what made it so special because I think we're getting so I'm already lost. So give us a <laughs> synopsis of your chronicle. <laughs> oh, synopsis of my chronicle. Oh, uh, so the chronicle at its crux was about the tension between the order that was coming in the world and the fear of decay that was driving that. Um, I'm a big fan of big cosmological like set pieces in my games, but using them as a way to speak to very intimate phenomenon. And that goes back to me being an occultist personally. Um, but I had two players in the game that were huge fans of the Exalted World of Darkness tie-in. I'd never used it before, but I knew they'd love it. So I went, cool, I'm going to do what makes my player's eyes light up. And so I decided to do a whole like pull in on kind of that weaver weirm conflict that isn't called out with those names in mage, but werewolf and mage kind of share that conflict in a lot of ways. Um, and so I wanted to do, oh God, this also pulls from some old like first edition mage stuff. I wanted to do the Asian technocracy autochthony a bit. So I set up this whole cosmological back background with a bit of autochthonia that had been broken off. And eventually the Chronicle was going to go and deal with the Dalo Laoshi, which are the Asian technocracy. But then this very primordial destructive mage from centuries ago that had gone into the deep at a point when in World of Darkness's history where destructive energy was still productive and necessary and, and essential and went on this, you know, spatial pilgrimage and then came back and discovered the horrible corrupt world where what he was couldn't really exist functionally anymore. And he effectively was kind of what a Nefandus maybe sort of should be, but didn't want to be that. But he was spilling out into the world. And so they never actually interacted with that entity, but they interacted with all the various things on Earth that were attuned to that. And so the game was really designed to sort of highlight the, here are these toxic manifestations of order. Here are these toxic manifestations of decay. And neither of them want to be toxic because we're not in the modern world of darkness yet. They want to be something better. Your mages, can you fix this? 
And like, I wanted to present the most large scale, ridiculous thing ever at this critical moment in the development of the world of darkness where a group of mages, if they were willing to think, if the players were willing to think as big as awakened characters actually think, I wanted to give them the opportunity to fix it at least a little and play through like what that psychology would do and the horrible things they'd have to do in pursuit of it and how much they'd have to get past their own myopic view of who their enemies were. Um, and it was really messy and I did not always succeed. Like I was, I was aiming for something that was very difficult. Um, two of my players were incredibly ridiculously experienced. One of them used to write for the line and a couple of my other players were only kind of medium experienced. And then halfway through the game, when everyone but one person was already a master, a new guy joined and it was his first role playing game ever. Oh my God. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> And he did amazingly well, even though he constantly looked like he had no idea what was going on. <laughs> um, yeah. But was that so, Craig? When you mentioned uh, that one. Y yes, <laughs> Craig. Craig was was one of my players. Um, the guy who joined was Craig's current partner. So cool. I want a game so how did this game wrap up? Hmm. <laughs> so uh, how did this game wrap up? Uh, so most of the story was centered around, um, oh, my mind has just gone blank on canon character names, th which is terrible. Um, oh, the Solificatus, who was destroyed in a uh, fragile oh, path. Hey yes, Halel. Hey Two of my NPCs were Halel's children. I used Halel's oh, twins. Wow. Um, and I, <laughs> oh <my> so <laughs> I set them up as inventing uh, Primium. And I set it up because I thought the whole idea of Primium being wrapped up in kind of the alchemical tension of opposite forces. So I gave them twin souls and I set it up where Halel had been emerging of one axis of the primal quadrants of the, of the um, essence quadrants. And they were the other axes and Halel and Halel's children were all an intentional designed working of the Solificatus that was completely ruined by that um, Gilgooling. Like that, that went sideways and none of it played out the way it was supposed to. Um, and so I had one of the twins very much wrapped up in questing and one of the twins very much wrapped up in order. And they were opposites, but because they were twins and they loved each other so much, they were able to bring the differing halves of the alchemical paradigm necessary to actually invent Primium. Um, and so they create this thing that is both matter and spiritual in the most ridiculous way possible. And then they, for their enlightenment and everything else, and what they've created becomes a major point of contention that all enlightened beings want to control and to claim. And they're not really interested in that because for obvious reasons, they trust fucking no one. Um, I also had them having witnessed the Gilgooling, not that the council was aware of that having happened. And so they brought this enormous amount of emotional baggage to their ability to trust and reach out and coordinate with anyone. Um, and so in the end, I set it up, and this ties into some werewolf story. So I had a, a piece of Autochthonia having been ripped off and that piece being what the werewolves think of as Ananasa or the within the Garu canon, but it's not really that. Um, and so there was this like functional piece of weaver energy over here, and it was slowly separating from the celestial sphere that was the rest of order. The idea being that they were about to shatter apart. And so there were things they could do on the ground that as above, so below kind of story structure that were more, we'll call street level to help fix what was going on and how that was emanating. But then the whole idea is the game would eventually ascend into that sphere. And so those twins and they had to help them and guide them and figure out what was going on were eventually through their twin souls, able to embed themselves into these two separate spheres and give up the rest of existence. They exist forever in this very like godlike Prometheus space of never quite letting those two things completely separate. And so the whole chronicle was about can the players sacrifice enough and cooperate across these like core paradigmatic separations in the world of mage enough to make this thing happen. And not that it's going to fix the world of darkness. It's still the world of darkness, but maybe we don't need to be so toxically terrified of decay 
and maybe we can do order a little bit better and reflecting that in the celestial sort of questing RPG space and in seeing what the impact of it is in the day-to-day -day world as it played out through the various cultures they moved through. So the conclusion of the Chronicle was the ascension and the sacrifices necessary to put these twins in this space and to also get over the hump near the end of the Chronicle where they realized what they were going to have the twins do would consign them to eternal suffering and pain because they had to give up everything they were to keep these two celestial spheres in balance. And there was this moment where the twins were totally like, yes, we are doing this. But the players kind of had to stare at it like, wait, I like have relationships with these people. And in one case, it was kind of turning into romantic. This is the right thing to do, but like, I can't, how, how, do, I, how do I do that? And so I tried to throw those sorts of quandaries at them as often as possible. This is brilliant. I want a game with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I it want was... a game with you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, that game was often chaotic. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but there were a couple game sessions where I was just like, what have I done? <laughs> Well, your game is super cosmic in scope and the moral consequences. I think that's what makes World of Darkness so unique. But as a noob, I have to ask some questions. Now, uh, when you brought up the parentage of these twins, uh, Satyros let out a ooh, and I have no idea why. And you talked about the gagoling, and I'm like, what the fuck is a gagoling? So let's talk about <laughs> those two things. <laughs> well, so uh, say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just actually going to say I will I will let you answer this because you'll probably do it more <laughs> elegantly than I will. So, the short version of the long story with uh, with with the fragile path is that as we've talked about on previous podcasts, I, I'm I'm very very influenced by uh, by Akira Kurosawa's film Rashomon, and so when we were coming up with when when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do for Mage's Book of Nod, I said I want to have the story of a terrible thing told from multiple perspectives as in Rashomon and so uh, brought together a team on that one uh, Al going back James Moore um, Beth Fiske um, Tina Jens and why am I blanking on the name of I shouldn't be um, but in, in any case we uh, in any case, we came up with, I came up with the idea that I wanted to have this thing happen. We came up with the characters and they were brainstormed and uh, brainstormed out within the group. And Bill had Bill Bridges <clears throat> when he was working on the uh, the first edition uh, Sons of Ether book had brought up the idea of the Salificati. He created the concept, and uh, I you know being familiar with occult history and looking at alchemy i came up with the idea of one of the characters maybe the the the, the flashpoint character being a rebus which is in alchemical terms someone who is a union of masculine energy and feminine energy two different people merged and two different souls merged into a single body uh, and that theme plays out a bit more in Sorcerer's Crusade as well uh, in the prelude for Sorcerer's Crusade by Storm Constantine but anyway so James uh, Jim Moore decided he, he wanted to uh, to write that story. And what we ended up having in The Fragile Path was that character, Hael, Hale uh, declaring, yes, I did a terrible thing. Here's why I did it. I had my reasons. This is what I see coming. Uh, this is what I see happening. I did this thing to catalyze. I'm sacrificing myself to catalyze um you know to 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 catalyze this situation as as is done you know in uh, as is done in alchemy to go through the steps of of decay and uh of, you know, decay and transformation and perfection said i'm i'm starting the decay process right here right now boom kill me and what halal did was betray the uh there was a group called the first cabal who were basically the ambassadors slash enforcers of the newly forged traditions they were supposed to be a symbol of unity they ended up being a mess and the fragile path is a story about what the hell happened and everyone involved in uh, in the book is telling a different 
telling their perspective of what happened. Uh, in Halel's case, he betrayed them to the um, they, I should say, not he was not the, they um, betrayed the first cabal to the uh, to the order of reason, uh, which later became the technocracy. And for for doing uh, that, killed off about half of the cabal by the time they were rescued. And as a result, uh, uh, as, as a result, um, Halel was uh, Gilgold with had had its had her they <laughs> soul destroyed ripped in uh, ripped into pieces and scattered and the body scattered as well and uh, the Silificati, the group to which Halel had belonged split the council as well and basically said you know screw you guys we're going our separate ways and did uh, in the fragile path and it's been years since I read it but as I recall uh, the the verbena uh, Nightshade had had a relationship with Hale, with Halel and had twins. Is that yes? It? Yeah, and those those were the twins. Um, uh -huh. And and specifically, what I wanted to play around with is I kind of wanted to double down on that tension of <laughs> what Halel was as a working. And I thought, okay, so real world alchemy focuses on the joining of opposites, but there are four essences that make up mages what if they were trying to join all four of them and halel and i realized I, I misstated a second ago what if halel was the joining of the questing and the dynamic um the yeah i think it was questing and dynamic essences and the twins and i set them up with twin souls um one of them had primal and one of them had static because to me, that primal static divide was is really at the crux of most of the corruptive story, cosmological story in the world of darkness. Um, and I'm I'm a I'm a big believer when I run the world of darkness, and I tend to run it in a unified way, especially with mage. Slightly less so with changeling, but especially with mage, I feel like it sits well at the center of the world of darkness. Everyone's truth is kind of true. Um, but a lot of times it's, you know, Weirmweaver and um, the Triad, Weirmweaver and Wild aren't actually like three family members that are having a spat. That's the mythology the werewolves use to understand actual legitimate forces that are impacting the cosmology of the world. And that's just the mythology that they use to lens it. It can exist. I don't need to make any of that literal. And so viewing that and really like tripling down on an unreliable narrator is a lot of what I do when I'm building what's really going on in the universe of the world of darkness. Cool. Yeah. Interesting, uh, interesting background on that, that, uh, that, that sort of meta, that meta cosmological um, uh, conflict there is that the primary people, uh, the primary designers involved in that, in that idea were Mark Reinhagen with uh, in in Werewolf and Mark is a Mark Mark is a reformed preacher's kid, you know, grew up with uh, with the, the the you know the 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 heavy Christian background and rebelled against it and was rebelling against it big time in the world of darkness. Uh, Sam Chupp, who is pagan through and through, and has as, as far as I'm aware has always been, uh, and Stuart Wick, who. Stuart and I never talked about religion per se, but he was he was a phenomenally he was a brilliant um, I think he was an atheist or an agnostic, but he was uh, he was a, a brilliantly intellectual person who was always looking at the um, let's say the uh, the, the a, a rationalist perspective on mysticism, if that makes sense, um, and a mist conversely also a mystical take on rationality. He's the person who came up with the uh, the Cain, the 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 idea of uh, vampires as children of Cain, and the Book of Nod and all of that. Although he didn't write that, that was uh, that was Sam Chupp and, and Andrew Greenberg wrote the book, but the concept was Stewart's. And Stewart was also very heavily influenced by two things that involved a conflict of uh, conflicting uh, conflict of dynamic energies obviously white wolf <laughs> with uh, with elric uh and and the eternal champion books 
Uh, he was very influenced by those, and also by Robert Piercig, uh, whose book uh, Lila, Lila um, deals with the the idea that certain people and certain certain people embody the force of progress, and other people embody the uh, the, the, the the force of, of stagnation. Uh, I brought entropy to the table when I uh, when I joined the when I joined the team and took over Mage, but um, but that that conflux of the rebellious Christian, uh, the dedicated pagan, and the uh, and the, the the intellectual metaphysician uh, created that uh, that worm weaver wild uh, you know dyna dynamism stasis entropy and uh, Th those forces <laughs> that's where that came from and and uh, yeah i'll just shut up there <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, it's funny how much of this stuff is rooted in the uh, in the people obviously the people who created it uh and the fact that we were all so fucking young and we when we did it is just kind of mind-blowing <laughs> so victor one of the things you brought up uh, before we started the show is that one of the things you really appreciated about the sorcerer's crusade is the opportunity to explore uh, well, explore a less explored historical territory. So what was that like? So I really loved running in the Renaissance. I didn't spend an enormous amount of time in the Sorcerer's Crusade source books. Um, I spent a fair bit of time in the Order of Reason book and a little bit of time in the Swashbuckler's Handbook, but most of my time was spent on Wikipedia in historic articles yeah. where I would just go and look up the area I was in and the year I'd set the game and be like, what's going on in this place at this time? And it let me do some really interesting things. Um, the Renaissance is so rife with just like opportunities to pull a little string and have it just cascade. Um, so in the Venetian setting, and the reason we had to leave Venice so quickly, I <laughs> they accelerated Venice's development a lot. Uh, I started the game in 1501, which was kind of the height of Venetian power. Uh, this is well before the Black Plague and the Inquisition and all of these other things. Um, and Venice had a lot of autonomy at that point because it was kind of the gateway to the rest of the world. And... I set Venice up as having kind of a light truce between um, the order of reason and the traditions. And I started it out as like it was weird in Venice. Later, when I started the game, I didn't own the order of reason book yet. I bought it uh, a couple months into the game, so I'd have it as a resource. And I read the order of reason, and it did this fascinating thing where it basically said, yeah, during the Renaissance, the traditions and the Daedalans, Daedalans being the common parlance for order of reason didn't hate each other nearly as much as the union pretends um they actually they they kind of had a i don't trust you but you know if you're not one of the really toxic traditionalists whatever and that was basically what i had going on in venice which i thought was fascinating i loved that um but what i what i had set up is like there was this tenuous truce and everybody kind of got along. The traditionalists weren't allowed to go too off the deep end and victimize anyone. And the order of reason, you know, didn't attack mystical things if they weren't toxic. And everyone like, okay, we get along because we got a good thing going on here with being powerful. The players come in and I have this delicate like balancing act happening and they just bulldozed it. <laughs> um, they, they bulldozed it. Uh, they had a bad scourge effect which that's a whole like rules crunchy thing. There's no paradox in Sorcerer's Crusade. There's Scourge, which is in my opinion, better than paradox in every way. I love Scourge so much. Um, it's yeah, it's fantastic. Um, but they had a really bad Scourge effect and I did a slight house rule tweak to Scourge in the book. It, most of the Scourge effects talk about taking traits onto the mage. I really like how in a lot of the mage fiction, paradox or Scourge reshapes the magic being done um, and sort of ripples out into the world. So instead of focusing so much on you have this negative modifier for a while because you rolled one on a Scourge die, I made it, you rolled a one on a Scourge die, how much Scourge do you have? This is going to do really fascinating things to your magic. Let's see what goes on. <laughs> um, and obviously, if you're using magic on yourself, then traits more like those merits and flaws would happen because, oh, I'm doing a mind effect and turning on a sphere site. So then it was the magic reforming. But they had a really unfortunate Scourge effect, and it caused a tremor 
um, in Venice, and it drew the attention of the church. And so the church sent some inquisitors, which should have been mm -hmm. fine, mm -hmm. except then our mage with, you know, fey affinity decided to go diving in and find a fairy and ask them to go take care of the inquisitors. That was, there were no terms put on this at all. Just go take care of the inquisitors. Make them not make it here. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, that's going to be great. So this little slua child... <laughs> I was not planning on doing a ton with fairies in this game, but it happened. Um, went and did what, you know, the Fae do and tried to stop them and did a lot of damage. But of course, this is the Inquisition. So they went, wait, what? That's clearly a demon. What's going on in Venice? <laughs> and then they just kept pushing and they just kept pushing. And it went from like the local members of the Order of Reason being like, okay, cool, with like one or two of them wishing that the truce would end, to the Gabrielites coming in in force. <laughs> the Gabrielites just coming in in force. And the players kept pushing, and I went, okay, cool. Uh, so all these things that are supposed to happen in 30 years, where all of the ley lines are moved away and all the nodes are taken away from Venice because they open trade routes south of Africa, you've just upped that timeline by 50 years. Venice is now irrelevant, or will be irrelevant in five years. Good luck, guys. Like, it's happening. Um, <laughs> And I was just like, global conspiracy in the context of like 1500s global, what does that mean? But like Europe-wide conspiracy and you just keep kicking them in the back of the knee, what do you think's gonna happen? Mm. <laughs> and they just destroyed Venice. But I had this amazing historical context to look at and go, oh, the movement, like opening the trade route south of Africa to India would be moving nodes it would be moving ley lines that's a prime effect and so you know i was able to look at that and go okay cool the order of reason had planned this working anyway they just moved up the timeline of when they executed it and they took explorators off all the other stuff they were doing and said make this happen you know i had so much fun with paradigm just mm -hmm. like stepping back and going, what are these big earth shattering, like major society reorganizing things? And that's just a magic effect because like it is, that's so much of what the big conspiratorial mage effects are. And, you know, I remember at one point, one of my players was like, well, can't we just get rid of the Gabrielites? And I'm like, maybe, maybe you could get them out of Venice. And that would make this effect even more acute. Mm -hmm. They would hammer it down even harder. <laughs> Like that, that was the hardest thing with the, with my players was getting them to understand the full scope of, yes, you can do these things. You are ridiculously powerful, but no really repercussions. Um, there was a lot of that. <laughs> so, so I, let's explain how close Rome is to Venice. Oh, wait, wait. Oh wait, wait. yes. Speaking of the Gabrielites. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. That's where they came from. <laughs> So Go ahead. One, I'm going to have to interject because we're coming close up in an hour. So I have so many questions, Victor, but I'm going to have to okay. save this for like maybe talking on Facebook or Twitter. Um, okay. But before we wrap this up, if you could run this Chronicle again, what would you do differently? Um, I'd be a little bit more explicit about opening setting. Um, I told everyone we're going to start in Venice and I had one or two players that made characters that really didn't actually fit that setting. Uh, I would probably reel back on the cosmological stuff at the end a little bit. Um, because I, when I stepped back, it, it got a little out of scale at the very end. Most of it I loved, but at the very end, it got hard to grapple with. Like things were working in my head and it was all a little too abstract. So if I had to redo the last like tenth of the Chronicle, I'd reel that in a little bit. Um... And I would have probably made, there was a whole arc in China where I wanted to put them in the imperial court and make it very social and very structured. And I had the Xiang Xiang there and the Wu Lung as two sides of the imperial court with the Akashiana operating outside of the court. Um, and I would make that less strict. Like I was expecting a lot of social magic roles and detail and nuance and my players were just like, <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm in a gilded cage. I don't love this. So I had to leave that setting a lot sooner than I would have liked. And I think I was just a little too strict 
with different players, I could have done that story, but like I would have been more careful to think through, no, really, who's playing this? Is this setting a good idea in a couple places? Um, I, I think those would probably be the biggest things I would change. Man, that is a fantastic game, and I wish I was a part of it. Uh, well, we're going to have to go now, uh, but before we do, uh, gentlemen, uh, Victor, if people wanted to learn more about you or listen to your podcast, where's the best place to find you online? Uh, the best place to find me online is really I'm pretty active on Facebook and 99% of my posts are public. So Victor Joseph Kinzer on Facebook or walkingawayfromarcadia.podbean.com or the Walking Away From Arcadia page on Facebook. Um, those are probably the best spots. Also, Victor is one of the writers on the Mage 20 line. He is one of the co-authors on the uh, on the Mage uh, the Mage Cookbook and is working on, I believe it's a Victorian Mage, isn't it, that you're... Uh... Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can't wait for that. And Saturus, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on Facebook at both uh, Saturus Phil Brucato author and at my Phil Brucato uh, personal Facebook. I'm trying to avoid doing too much professional work on my on my personal facebook these days um, i also have a blog at satoros filbrucado at wordpress.com and have a patreon which has all kinds of i think over 150 uh, uh over 150 updates worth of goodies on it at uh, again uh, satoros filbrucado at, at, at uh, uh, on patreon you can find us online at magethepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Twitter on Mage the Podcast. And also you can check out our Mage Twitter chronicle, and that would be hashtag MTRPG. Again, that's hashtag MTP, uh, excuse me, MTRPG. And you can subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and now on the TuneIn app. And I highly recommend you giving review to the show on iTunes because I know every podcast says it and I have to say it myself, but it really does bump up the algorithm and help people find the show. And uh, join us again next week. We will have Josh Heath. He's the host of the Werewolf, the podcast. He's actually the guy who said, why don't you name your show Mage the Podcast? It's brilliant. Hmm. He's coming on next week and we're going to be talking about myth and mage. So for Victor Joseph Kinzer and Satoris Bricado, I'm Joseph Aleo. Thanks for listening to Mage the Podcast. See you next week. Thank you, everyone.